all, thank you so much the National Archives um, for hosting this exciting event. Welcome to all of you who are here. I'm so enthusiastic to have this chance to talk with Rob, with Rob, Robert Parkinson, about his really compelling and accessible new book, 13 Clocks. But Rob, can you tell us a little bit about this book, which um, tells us a lot about the founding of America? Sure. Thank you, Serena. And thank you for the National Archives for, for hosting this. This is, this is a lot of fun to get to talk about this book, um, which is uh, we'll talk about over the next hour, comes from a much, much bigger book. Uh, but um, so I guess, I guess I would start with the title of where the title comes from. So if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, the title comes from uh, a quote from John Adams. And John Adams, when he was a very old man, uh, close to the um, age of the portrait in the corner, uh, he... Uh, when the revolutionary generation was sort of dying off, there was this um, need to try to find out what all, uh, sort of unpack uh, the brains of the founding fathers uh, as they got older. And so a, a Baltimore uh, journalist named Hezekiah Niles, a, a printer in, in Baltimore, wrote letters to John Adams and other people wanting to know, hey, what went down in 1776? What was your take on it? And so, so um, John Adams had thought a lot about this over the years. Um, he'd written to Thomas Jefferson about this who, well, over the years. So this was his response to Niles in 1818. He's in, in his early 80s in 1818. He said to Niles, the colonies had grown up under constitutions of government so different, and there was so great a variety of religions, and they were composed of so many different nations their customs, manners, and habits had so little resemblance, and their intercourse had been so rare, and their knowledge of each other so imperfect, that's a long list of problems, that to unite them in the same principles and theory and the same system of action was certainly a very difficult enterprise. Next slide, please. Adams continued, the accomplishment of it in so short a time and by so simp such simple means was perhaps a singular example in the history of mankind. 13 clocks were made to strike together a perfection of mechanism which no artist had ever before affected. And by when people of, of Adams's generation talk about an artist like that, some, he actually might even be referring to God. So even God might not have had, could have, could have done what we did in 1776. Look how awesome we are. Um, Adams uh, is, is very much saying, talking about the miracle of, of unity, the miracle of the the so-called common cause, or the all these th all these thirteen colonies coming together as becoming one United States, and so this notion, I mean, and, and again, I think John Adams is very much right about how long the the stakes were, how or I'm sorry, how long the odds were, how great the stakes were. If I could have the next slide, please. We talk about we, this is a very famous image. Right. And we and I asked my students this in class, when is it that that um, the colonies are going to decide to join rather than die? And it's much, 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 much later than we like to think it is. Right. Um, uh, Benjamin Franklin, of course, draws this very famous cartoon in 1754, but it is a disaster. The colonists are going to choose or die all through the 1750s, all through the 1760s, and much further into the 1770s than we might even uh, think about. So, so Adams is right about this. Uh, he says it was, a, it, was, it was a miracle. It was certainly a miracle that this happened. And this, is, this has always been something that's very much fascinated me. How did people who didn't know each other, didn't like each other, had all these problems going on, um, who fought about... Um, uh, who were having horrible border crises, who fought over religion, slavery was becoming even more of a, of a difficulty. Some people thought that the imperial crisis was a way to uh, get rid of slavery. Some people thought that it was a way that should be protect that slavery should be protected in the empire. They didn't agree with each other. And then on top of all that, you have uh, the loyalists sort of counterattack uh, the, the saying that what the Patriots are doing is itself uh, against the law uh, and a breaking of all sort of uh, order in the empire. So you have all these things is what is what Adam says. 
There's so many things going against it. And as I say to my students all the time, the surest bet is to take all of your money and go to Las Vegas and bet it against the 13 colonies staying together. Everybody thought so. Everybody in England thought it was a, it was a joke. Uh, they would immediately fall into civil war. Uh, and it was just a, going to be a huge problem. Um, so uh, Adams says uh, in, in, in the same letter, if I have the next slide, please. How are we going to find out what happened in the revolution? Um, well, uh, Adams in 1815, when he still is an old man, he says, this is what we should do to find out how this happened. Um, young men of letters in all the states should undertake the laborious but certainly interesting and amusing task of searching and collecting all the records, pamphlets, newspapers, and even handbills of the 13 colonies to find out how the temper and views of the people had changed. And that how question is really what, what I'm interested in, um, is the sort of the procedural things. How did, uh, did these colonies, with all these problems, come together? That was, that was the big question. Um, and, uh, and Adams writes this to Jefferson in their sort of correspondence. He talks about this also in his letter to, to Niles. No things. Again, like I said, Adams is thinking about this at, towards the end of his life quite a bit. So I began thinking about this. I began, I, I began this, this is, is 13 clocks, this short little guy, um, which is very thin and, and, uh, and as, as Serena and Lovely said, uh, readable and accessible. Uh, it comes out of something that is not so much. It comes out of this book, which is, uh, as you can see from the from the the wide angle lens, something much much bigger. It wops in at a, at at seven hundred and fifty pages. I've been thinking about this for uh, twenty years, uh, really. Uh, it started out as a dissertation uh, in that I started researching in the year two thousand, and, and uh, the the big fat book came out in twenty sixteen, and thirteen clocks came out last year. So I've been thinking about these issues very much. How did they do this? Uh, and this this letter from Adams about the newspapers is what really where I started this. So I began um, trying to figure out in many ways, what was the news feed to use today's parlance, kind of like a Twitter news feed? What was the news feed like in 1775, 76? What what did people know about what was going on in the revolution? How, I tried to track on the ver on the ground. What was their what their arguments were or what was how, how were they talking about trying to get people mobilized? Um what were the things they were uh, they were trying to uh, the stories they were trying to tell the images that they were constructing the arguments that they were making so i followed adams's advice and i went to the newspapers and i started reading them and 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 reading them, and reading them, and reading them. over the course of a couple of years uh, and because this is the american revolution we have almost all of them uh uh, unlike lots of other kinds of history, uh, we have a very, very thick archive for this, so um, which is lucky. And I began to be surprised. For, well, first of all, one of the reasons why um, the book, this book, is this thick um, is because of all the stuff that I found there. I found a tremendous amount of material, uh, a tremendous amount of material that was about uh, a couple of things that surprised me. One was about how much, how often, how deeply, and how, um, uh, and how uh, uh, sort of repeatedly I was reading about slave insurrections in those newspapers and how I was reading about uh, native hostility on the frontier. I was reading about that, those two things um, a lot, a lot more than I expected to find. Uh, and it, that that archive was getting thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. Um, and I was also uh, uh, I, so I was reading about those things. And I also in my in my sort of very sort of Luddite um, research method, I was also then sort of going through all the papers of the founding fathers uh, so that we've that, that that our federal government has <laughs> paid for these lovely projects of the papers of Thomas Jefferson and, and Henry Lawrence and George Washington and Ben Franklin and the papers of the of Congress and the letters of the delegates to Congress, all that stuff that we have these glorious, lovely letterpress editions of. And I was going through and pulling out all of the references that they were writing to one another about, about those two topics. 
slave, slave insurrections and British involvement with them and native hostility and British involvement with them. And for 1770, and, I, and so I collated every single one. And for 1776 alone, just that year, single spaced, all of those things together, all those stories ran to more than 1,000 pages of Microsoft Word documents about those issues, right? So I would, in my, in my old graduate school computer uh, laptop, I would pull up 1776 and then I'd go get breakfast because it had to load this thousand page document that I could then search. And then if I, if I touched it at all, it would, the whole computer would crash. It was so, so, so big. Of, of them talking about these issues. So I'm seeing it in the newspapers. I'm seeing it all the time in here. And I'm not exactly seeing it as much in the historic, the scholarship that we're doing. Yes, some, but not to this effect. Not about these issues. About African-Americans serving in the Continental Army? Yes. About um, African-Americans serving in the British Army or fighting in the Revolution? Yes. Lots of scholarship on that. About, about Native participation in, in the Revolution? For sure. But about... The, the patriot leaders trying to use these stories in terms of mobilization, not so much. So that, and the other thing that I also learned from these newspapers was um, I was reading the same thing over and over again, over and over and over again. I was reading the same story in the same, t in the same words, the same language. And I began to think, well, that's super weird. Why, what's going on here? If I could have the next slide, please. What I was also beginning to understand is how much these guys, and they're mostly men, <laughs> uh, are, uh, are g understanding the power of the press and how to, uh, to propagate, to, um, to get these stories out into the public. And so this, now this is, a, this is a, taken from John Adams' diary in 1769 when he looks much closer to this picture as opposed to an old man. I love this one too, because he's kind of giving you a little bit of the side eye in this picture, like, like something might not totally be up, up and up in this. I love it. Because what he's saying in his diary is, the evening is spent preparing for the next day's newspapers, a curious em employment, cooking up paragraphs, articles, occurrences, working the political engine. What Adams is referring to in this diary is he and his cousin Sam and James Otis were in the offices of the Boston Gazette, working with Benjamin Eads and John Gill, the printers, making stuff up, what we might today call fake news, uh, about uh, all sorts of... Uh, Rob, can you hold on just one moment? We're just gonna start, um, we, we lost the audio feed for a moment. Um, okay. So can you just, I'm sorry, um, can you just back up a, a few minutes maybe, um, as maybe back to where you started um, talking, actually, I'll back you up a couple minutes to um, to seeing the same stories repeatedly in the papers. OK, I'm going to take this opportunity to do not disturb myself. OK, OK, so back to is that OK? Uh, I think so. OK, all right. So. One of the, the things that I was seeing is I was seeing in the newspapers the same story over and over and over again, in the same words, in the same sentences, same articles. And I began to think about what that meant for sort of this movement of trying to get people to overcome all of their problems, all of the things that were going on. And, and I, I also began to sort of understand how involved the John Adamses and Ben Franklins and Thomas Jeffersons and George Washingtons of the world were in putting these news feeds of peoples together. And so this is, this is from a, uh, a diary that Adams, uh, John Adams diary from 1769. And it says in this, in, um, and this is a picture of John Adams closer to uh, when he is uh, the, the age of which he writes this in 1769, he says in his diary, the evening was spent in preparing for the next day's newspaper, a curious employment, cooking up paragraphs, articles, occurrences, and working the political engine, which suggests that he's in some ways manipulating the news. Adams writes this on a Sunday night, um, and the next day's newspaper, the, the September 4th edition that comes out on Monday, is full of things that may or may not be true. Uh, and Adams, John Adams is there with his cousin Sam Adams and James Otis and the two Boston Gazette printers, and they're putting things together that 
may or may not be exactly what the news is. And so you're seeing a lot of kind of editorial management going on to what people are doing. And, and um, the, the things that are in this Boston Gazette newspaper that comes out on Mar uh, September 4th would then just um, be reprinted in other places. What uh, the, the parlance of the, of the term then was called the exchanges. This is, there were no reporters or, or, um, or journalists at this time. So the bulk of the news that, that new people are seeing in the newspapers, and, and there are about 36 newspapers in, um, in, most, of the, uh, uh, in most of the port cities of, of America at this point, they get the bulk of their news from one another. It's called the exchanges. And so the things that Adams, the Adams cousins are putting in the newspaper in Boston could then be repeated in Philadelphia or Annapolis, or Williamsburg. And you might not know if it's true or not true. And so I began to think about what's going on here and how this could be something that enables the clocks to work together. Enables the clocks to work together. Um, for me also, uh, uh, I wanted to think especially about the war itself. Okay, can I have the next slide please? The war as its own thing. Um, in that same uh, letter to, uh, to, to John, the Jefferson that, um, that he uh, talks about, what do we mean by the revolution? Uh, what do we, uh, wh where do we find the answers for it? It's in, the, it's in the newspapers and things. He says, what do we mean by the revolution? The war, that's no part of the revolution. It's only an effect or a consequence of it. The revolution was in the minds of the people, and this was affected from 1760 to 1775. So Adam says, uh, the miracle that happens of bringing the 13 clocks together happens before the shooting starts. And this, I think, is not entirely true or the case. It's kind of this John Adams side-eyeing us, cooking up, cooking up paragraphs, John Adams, as opposed to the old guy on the left. There's a lot more going on here to make these clocks strike together than he would like to admit. It's not a kind of an organic process. There's a lot of management. There's a lot of, a lot of cooking up that has to do. Can I have one more slide, please? We don't think of the war being really super important because we, we have been, historians have been trained by books like this very, very, very famous book that's now 50 years old um, called The Ideological Origins of the American Revolution. Probably the most important book, I would say, written last, last half of the, of the 20th century, Serena, I would think. Um, and two chapters of this book are started with epigraphs that come exactly from this quote. What do we mean by the revolution? The war, the war had nothing to do with it. John Adams writes that to Jefferson in 1815 and he plagiarizes himself in 1818 when he writes it to Hezekiah Niles and says the exact same thing. So this book has taught us that the big bulk of the work happens before any bullets fly. And that's also what I wanna look at is now that people's bodies are on the line and they have to, and they're, and they're they really have to put their families and their and their futures at stake and might get killed for this. Does that raise the stakes? And I think it does. And um, and so to my mind, we begin to see these things happening more and more and more. And I want to I want to wrap this up really quickly by talking about uh, some of the things that I'm seeing. Could I have the next slide, please? Here's what I'm seeing in these newspapers after the shooting starts that I wasn't seeing before in that time in the when. What do we mean by the war? It had nothing to do with it. Stories like this. The Canadian governor, Guy Carleton, and British superintendent, Guy Johnson, is meeting with natives 1,500 miles back in Quebec to make them great offers to take up arms against the colonists. You're seeing that kind of story pop up and then be repeated and then over and over again. That would be in the New Hampshire Gazette, but then it would be also in Philadelphia newspapers and the Norfolk newspaper and the Williamsburg newspaper the Norfolk printer actually turned it into 15,000 miles, which, which always cracks me up. Uh, and then the following week, another report saying that that uh, Canadian, uh, or I'm sorry, British Superintendent Guy Johnson is, is suspected of endeavoring to stir up the Indians against the colonies. And that's also in all of these newspapers too, but in New York and then in Connecticut and then in Boston and then in Salem and then again in, in New Hampshire. Um, next slide, please. And then uh, we see stories like this one. This is one of my very favorite ones. Um, uh, uh, this comes from a letter written by Philip Schuyler, um, he of the very famous Three, three Schuyler Sisters Daughters uh, uh, from, from the musical. Uh, he writes a letter to the Continental Congress saying, the Indians delivered us a speech on the 12th in which they related the substance 
of all the conferences that Guy Johnson or Colonel Johnson had with them in the summer, of which they ordered invited us to feast on a Bostonian and drink his blood. And and that letter ends up at the Continental Congress and they order it printed and it's printed all over the place in Philadelphia and New York and Baltimore and Boston three times and Williamsburg, et cetera, et cetera. We're seeing those kind of things happening more and more and more. And there's and they're being officially um, uh, ordered to be printed. And so people are learning these things more and more and more. Um, can I have the next slide, please? In 1775, very famously, the Virginia governor, Lord Dunmore, uh, offers uh, freedom to uh, any able-bodied uh, male slaves who are the slaves of patriots who can make it to his lines. We think about a thousand do, but that also then becomes this really big sort of propaganda moment where you're seeing stories of those things go over and uh, over and over and over again. This is what I think is the thing that John Adams doesn't want us to think about but is so much more about the, uh, on people's timelines in, in, 17, in 1775 and 76, which is what this book is, is all about. Um, uh, could I have the next slide, please? Yeah, and I'll finish with this. We can talk about the Declaration because it's very much in the Declaration, but um, this is one of the people who becomes a victim of this, a, a British official uh, says, the newspapers were full of publications calculated, or cooked up, to excite the fears of the people, massacres and instigated insurrections were in the mouths of every child, words in the mouths of every child. And that was what I found so much uh, in, in these newspapers and in what people are talking about at the time. And I think we've underestimated how much patriot leaders embraced and used stories about race, uh, about the potential of slave insurrections and the potential of native hostility as a way to get these clocks to strike together, which is more than I wanted to say, but, uh, but I think that probably sums up most of the book. What do you think, Serena? Thank you. Yes, I think that was, um, that was a really helpful sort of overview of the book. And I wonder now if I could ask you to dig into two pieces of what you said that will maybe explain um, a little more to the um, to our audience, your subtitle. So the book is called 13 Clocks, How mm -hmm. Race United the Colonies, that's part one, and mm -hmm. two, made the Declaration of Independence. So that last part, you only sort of waved at. So we're going to get right. there. You talked to us first, um, largely about the newspapers. So right. here I want to ask you um, a, a question that maybe I'll read us a little naive, but I but I think it's worth asking, right? Which is, um, you talked about how you read these newspapers and you saw lots about slave insurrections and native conflicts on the frontier and that that surprised you. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, why don't you think that there were just a lot of insurrections and native conflicts? Mm -hmm. Why don't you think that the newspapers were actually just reporting the news. Ah. Um, so maybe you can start with explaining that to us. I think that will help us see the first part of your subtitle. Sure. Uh, there, well, when the news of this crazy, crazy thing, right? Civil war in the empire, which has never happened before, um, sort of comes out of Massachusetts that there's gonna be shooting now. Uh, this imperial crisis has reached this whole new level. Everybody, in many ways has to make a calculation about how this is going to affect their lives. Men and women all over, all over North America are going to have to think about this. And, and this is exactly what, I mean, Patriot leaders want people to pick their side. They, when they say, this is what, this is what Liberty means. You should follow our side of this. Um, enslaved people are going to have to, are going to think themselves about what's going on here. There are, um, uh, this is an opportunity that has never really happened before. It certainly hadn't happened in, for many people in the 18th century, not, not social disturbances of this magnitude. And it's going to sh shift many calculi on uh, all over sort of the, what we would refer to as the back country, uh, all the way from Canada to, uh, to Florida. There's going to be a new kind of dynamic going on here about uh, the civil war. And so people are, thinking about what this means to them. There are, um, there are some uh, potential, there's, there are some slave revolts that happen in North Carolina, 
Um, there's rumors of some in South Carolina. Uh, there are some happening in Virginia, even before uh, Dunmore's proclamation. Um, but for the most part, there isn't a, 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 a little bit surprising, there's not a massive uh, rising. And, and what's really ironic is Jefferson and the Declaration refers to the merciless Indian savages. Uh, very famously in the Declaration. But until the Declaration, uh, Native peoples had been merciful to the Americans, for sure. They, there had been very, very little. Only in like the four weeks before the 4th of July was there any real actual hostility happening. But everybody was worried about all of it all the time. As soon, If you trace the... If you trace the, the um, um, if you trace the sort of story of Lexington and Concord down, especially as it gets into Maryland, Virginia, and the Carolinas, almost immediately, people be, uh, the people they, in those places begin to think about what this means in terms of enslaved people. Oh my God! I mean, oh my God! What do we do about gunpowder and 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 slave and enslaved people? Uh, that that happens in Maryland. That happens in Virginia. That happens in South Carolina. So people begin to think about how this is going to affect the worlds that they live in. Those stories, so so there's some reality for sure, but there's also this kind of much bigger, I think, at that time, penumbra about about fear about these things and rumor and and what's gonna happen, what what might potentially happen that kind of makes that makes those things get bigger and bigger and bigger. And we see that in the declaration, um, the 27th and final uh uh, um, grievance of the declaration is about domestic insurrections and uh, and merciless Indian savages. Uh, that's to you know the, the declaration's grievances to me have they build in climax, they build in drama, they they reach a point, and that's the very last one. That's that's the deal breaker that the king has done this. So. There, okay. So, so what we're saying, if I'm recapping the earth correctly, is that yes, in that there, the upheavals that began really in the 1760s, mm-hmm. right, as um, the French are leaving North America, um, and there's what um, historians call the imperial crisis, right, mm-hmm. as the British Empire is trying to figure out how do we make sense of now a much larger empire than we had before, right? Right. We're going to do all kinds of things to organize and control it. That creates um, a number of conflicts with colonists and that becomes the crisis. Um, And um, so as the crisis continues to what heat up, right? Um, Mm -hmm. The the British um, government makes some choices. Colonists don't love them. They respond, right? And and people become harder and harder. um, Right. Edged until finally we get to um, April 19th, 1775, um, right. when one sees the um, the shooting of um, Minutemen, as we call them, right, in Lexington right. and Concord, um, which continues a, a set of other conflicts. Um, so that you're saying, of course, we know Lexington and Concord really happened. Right? right, like people really did die there. Um, but as that story keeps moving through the newspapers in something that looks a little bit like an AP news service, right? Mm-hmm. That's the, mm-hmm. the exchanges you're talking about. Right. They we start to collect to snowball, right, and pick up bigger and bigger ball bits of snow. Right. Um, and the bits that they pick up are not really stories about the. Um, you know, the particular minute men who die or anything about like what actually maybe happened on Lexington Green, the stories that they pick up are really stories of this racial conflict. Yeah. Is that? And they're also not at, at this point, they're also then not talking about constitutions or consent, right, or representation anymore or taxes in any way. This is what the stories become to be about. Yes. Yeah. So that's really helpful. So then, um, because w- then in 76, right, a year later, we get in a, whatever, 15 months, um, when actually the Continental Congress meets and constructs the Declaration of Independence, they don't forget about that language of, of 
rights that were violated, but they also don't forget right. about these arguments about race that have mm -hmm. been showing up in the newspapers, right? Yeah. So talk, right. talk to us another minute about that last complaint. Uh, uh, the complaint about race? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the things that, yeah, so the, 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 the R word, which is in the subtitle, right, how, how, how race unites the columns. That's the only place in the book where I actually use that word uh, because it is a word that is very much under construction in the 18th century. Um, and this is what I think in many ways is the, is the, magic, the magic formula that overcomes all these problems that, that, that Adams lays out in that 1818 letter, all these things that they don't have in common. When, when patriot leaders who are very desperate to try to find something that can stick people together, when they open the sort of cultural toolbox, what's laying right on top are these fears about uh, our colonial attitudes that have grown up in the, in the 17th and 18th century about enslaved people um, killing them and their families, which stands to reason, uh, and, and, and about native hostility that's really grown uh, sort of uh, the generation uh, since the 1750s and 60s. They've been very much reminded, it goes way back, but very much reminded in the Seven Years' War and Pontiac's War um, about, about what that can look like. And that, I think, is what, what they embrace. Those things are unifiers uh, for these colonies, that people, in, more than sort of slavery itself, if you dis if you agree or disagree with slavery, that's a different thing than than this kind of racialized fear about what about the place of African Americans in in colonial and then sort of United States society and the republic we're building about that. That's the kind of um, that's where I think I think these things really matter. So I'm going to. Um step back a minute and and I think eventually we'll we'll come back to that question about what really matters right what work in some ways is this right. um, are these stories doing um, to something that you said at the beginning of your introduction when you held up for us the common cause at 750 pages right um, mm -hmm. and um, and said so this book is sort of derived from it but it's not the same book so could you talk a little bit about what's different about sure. this book from your 2016 book and, and why you decided you needed to write something smaller besides the fact that it's hard to ask undergraduates to read 750 pages in a term. Well, right. So, so uh, the, it's many ways the answer to that is having my cake and eating it too. Um, and part of it also was the, um, the, but what I mean by that is is writing something that people like you, Serena, uh, my scholar colleagues would read and, and sort of think about how they think about the revolution. Uh, and then and then having being able to write something that 19 year olds would also uh, not not hate reading. So that's what I mean by having my cake and eating it, too. But the one of the, the, the a core reason why the first book is so bloody long is because I wanted to sort of put out there how much of this stuff I was seeing. I wanted to kind of, um, I, I wanted to convey the, the, the heft of the archive. This is, this is not just kind of a epiphenomenal thing. This is not, uh, this is a central part of, of the revolutionary mobilization campaign, the, the common cause um, argument that we've really missed. That this is an important part of this, and this is, and these stories are what uh, um, the two things that the American leadership don't have a lot of is time and money. So when they, what they spend their time and money on, tells us how important it is to them, and they spend a lot of time and money on putting these stories together and getting them in, uh, uh, to the American people as much as they possibly can. Whenever there's a problem, when the war goes t terribly badly. They almost go always go back to these stories. They they write proclamations that feature them. They 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 put them in addresses. They go back to these over and over and over again. Um, so I wanted to sort of convey that, uh, and and, and uh, throughout the entire revolution. But the, the the thirteen clocks part is something we don't really do this anymore. We used to do this as a profession much better and than we do now, which is to 
to abridge big, thick, scholarly books and make it much more accessible. We used to do that when I was thinking about this. I went back and looked at Gary Nash's um, Urban Crucible and um, so-called fat phoner and thin phoner, right? The Eric Foner's, you know, reconstruction and then a short history of it. Um, even Ed Ayers has promised in the New South. He, he made it a, 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 a Winter Jordan's right over black. There's, there are thinner, um, more focused, uh, but much more sort of younger and more public facing uh, readers in mind for this. And um, the, uh, I wanted to do that. I wanted to, again, have my cake and eat it too and, and, ha and present this. And so I decided just to focus on what I thought was the most important thing, the 15 months between the shooting starting at Lexington and Concord and the Declaration of Independence and make that kind of the central part of, of this book and, and sort of distill the rest of it for, for everything else. So, um, yeah, so, so let me first affirm that when I say that this is, you know, a lovely book to teach, as you say, to 19 year olds, um, I mean, one of the reasons that that is so is because it's a book that one can read without a lot of guidance. So those of you who are watching or not actually in a class, you don't need, um, you know, a, someone to help walk you through this book. And this, Rob, you do a beautiful job of kind of unpacking this central problem that I think I want to redefine or, you know, or restate for you at least, and then ask um, us ask a question that just spoke to me as, as you were talking, um, because the central problem for both you and for John Adams, which I just find so surprising, is how did 13 clocks, right, 13 different colonies come to strike as one? And so, um, you know, you start with this, um, with Adams's own explanation for this, right, which is that there are all of these different, every colony was so different, they didn't share anything together, and yet somehow, through some miracle of God, practically, um, and maybe a little bit of help that maybe he's not going to be too clear about, um, right. that, you know, these colonies come together. And you, I think, if I understand this book correctly, think, you know, I'm not going to completely buy everything John Adams has to say to be here, right? right? I want to look eye. a little deeper, but the problem he identifies is the right one. This question mm -hmm. of how is it that colonies that were so disparate, that imagine themselves as having a relationship solely to the British Empire, not necessarily to each other, come to imagine themselves as a nation. Right. And so that, that tells us two things. First of all, how fragile the union is always and again, it's going to fall apart and have to be reconstructed, right? So the union always is an extraordinarily tenuous thing. It also talk, but that that's also an argument that I is dear to my heart about contingency. That these reaching into that toolbox for these specific images is a contingent thing. We would, and it's important to understand that while I agree, while I agree that with people who talk about how deeply embedded race is to, to American society, structurally, we have to understand how it got there. And, and that's the contingent part of thinking about these very specific things about the newspaper. How is it that these things that seem to be these massive sort of cloud banks of attitudes, how do they get fastened to the ground? That's a big part of this. So can you just for a moment define contingency as historians use that word? Sure. What do you um, say there? Uh, contingency means things didn't have to turn out the way they did. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's not inevitable that things had to be that way. And so we have to look at the, the, uh, the, t the specific time and place and look at the choices people made in the moment, why they did what they did. So some 70 years ago, maybe there was a, a, a book and not excellent book, but on the Declaration of Independence, right? But with an excellent title called Miracle at Philadelphia, right? Mm -hmm. That sort of just implied that somehow the heavens opened and the declaration dropped down, right? And right. your point is that's not the way in which the declaration was constructed. Not it at all. It wasn't the fight over the language. No. And I mean, Jefferson only has a handful of, I mean, 
Jefferson, one of the things that I talk about in, 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 the, in the sort of the construction of the declaration is just how pressed for time he is, that he's while he's writing the declaration, which he has about three weeks to do, he's also doing other things. He's the secretary of this investigation committee about um, about this disaster that happens in Canada um, as as the Canadian invasion falls apart. And that and, and it's the that's the first instance in which we begin to see natives acting with the British. Jefferson is involved in the, in the investigation of what has happened and the potential court martialing of American officers. And we have all those notes in his handwriting that's happening in the middle of June while he's supposed to be you know, off in his room writing this essay. You know, he's doing these other things like our students are, right? So thinking about this, but for what you, you know, Claire, I have so much enthusiasm as, as I do. I mean, could you find a favorite part or is that a little bit like talking about your favorite child? Um, <laughs> is there a favorite, favorite part, part of this book? Or a well, favorite story? Or something that really said to you, oh, now I know I've got this right. Now I know I've got this right. Um, or, or a favorite piece. Well, a favorite, a favorite story. Well, one of the the things that you know about about contingency is um, about how, especially in 1775, we we like to think that um, many of these dudes uh, knew what they were doing all the time, and, and and it just you know they weren't fumbling around in the dark and just um, entirely, in many ways, desperate to try to understand what's going on in the world around them. You know, kind of like we are today. And so, but they are, they're very, and so I, I um, uh, so uh, John Conley is a, um, a loyalist agent in Pittsburgh. And he's, he's big pals with Lord Dunmore, the, uh, um, the uh, governor of Virginia. And he has a plan. He is going to rouse the Shawnee and Delaware and Mingo Indians in sort of Western Pennsylvania, what's now Eastern Ohio. And he's going to, to get them to fight for the for the crown, and and Dunmore's gonna going to uh, free its enslaved people, and they're going to meet together at Washington's house in at Mount Vernon. They're going to cut the revolution in half, and they're going to meet and they're going to sort of have a sort of big party on the lawn at Mount Vernon. That's the plan. Conley goes to Dunmore. Dunmore says, "Sure, I don't care. Uh, it doesn't cost me anything." And he sends Conley up to to, to General Gage in Boston. And General Gage in November of 1775 says, okay, doesn't cost me anything. Knock yourself out, dude. Um, John Conley's servant is an Englishman named William Cowley, is freaks out about this and uh, uh, runs away and sneaks his way. When, when, when Conley's on his way back and he's going to go to Detroit and get people and, and this is what's going to happen, he sneaks away and he uh, he runs ashore in Newport, Rhode Island, and he makes his way to Washington's headquarters where he sort of knocks on the tent, I guess, and says, dude, I got news for you, right? This happens like four days after uh, the Continental Army's um, Surgeon General Benjamin Church has been found out to be a traitor, and they just like they just finished that trial, and then there's all of a sudden there's a knocking on the tent. Oh my God! And so Washington has like stays up all night writing letters to the Continental Congress. Oh crap! Like uh, we got to listen. Like that's the way 1775 is. It's uh, it's this constant um, just roiling of concern about about plots and what's true and what's not true and insurrections here and rebellions there, potential ones. It's just, it's, it's bananas. I think it's, it's so much, it's so much fun, but it certainly wasn't for them at the time. <laughs> yes. There's a lot going on at once, right? It feels like things are coming at Washington all the time. All right? the time. Everywhere. Yeah. 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 And so he's trying to organize it. Is he, is he trying to organize these politics in the same way that somebody like Adams or Jefferson who aren't, who really aren't in the front line at all are trying to organize it. Is that also part of his story? It, it is. It is. And one of the, one of the, uh, I'll give you a very small uh, thing that's, that's actually in the big common cause. That's not in 13 clocks, but um, Trenton uh, Christmas 1776, George Washington spends two and a half weeks organizing all of the logistics for Trenton, right? Trying to keep it secret wagons, boats, food, trying to get people to be there uh, for in the papers of George, of George Washington, I think it's 200 pages consecutively that 
Washington is concerned about just trying to get this thing to get pulled off. The night before the Trenton raid, there is a, a letter to the St. John's and Passamaquoddy Indians that, that Washington writes, who are, are native peoples in Maine, telling them, stay out of this. This is a fight between us and the British. Oh, either join us or stay out of us, but please don't join them. And I was like, look at this. Like the night before, it's like it's like Eisenhower writing the night before D-Day about something else. And you're like, wait a minute, what why are you doing this this night? Like you've been working on this for months. Um, why but that just shows you how much this is still that's still on his mind, that he's writing a kind of um uh an ambassador's letter. Hey, uh for them that's the kind of work that adams and jefferson and franklin do a lot more than washington but he does it too so um so you there have sort of anticipated my question about what is it that you know didn't quite make it from your 2016 book into this 2021 book right this right. these important other stories but i'm wondering then from your from from 13 clots which is you said of course is meant to be slim but if there are nonetheless some some threads in there that you would like to continue to play out moving forward things that you would like oh there's still more to be said about this particular part uh i do think there's there's more to be said about i i always I struggled in both books about the where to put uh, loyalists. Loyalists, loyalists is is, uh, is a is a, dif- a very difficult. Um, th- th- I think it's a very difficult thing to, to get your hands on, um, and and oftentimes when the patriots are trying to really get people's attention about loyalists, they almost always put them in groups with or in events with. <laughs> or in league with native peoples and enslaved peoples. They'll always talk about, well, a group of Tories and blacks did this, or a group of, of Indians and Tories do this. They're trying their best to connect those things together, but it's super difficult to do that. Um, getting your handle on that, I think, is also something else. Now, I also think that the, the inability to do that, to sort of fasten these things together, the slipperiness of that, makes it possible to do this other really weird thing that I also don't think we've gotten a super good handle on. A lot of historians are tr- have tried really hard to understand how easily Americans reintegrate na- uh, 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 loyalists into American society. There isn't a purge. There isn't any kind of, there's, there's a little bit, but it's really kind of there's no guillotine. sort of letting bygones be bygones. It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I don't. I don't feel like anybody's really nailed it yet. There's some some good work on that, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's just a mystery that that has no solution to it. I don't know. But that that to me seems like something else that that I would I would like to to try to keep working on myself. I think that's a really interesting point that loops back to something that you started with, which is that at least in 1775, 1776, this feels like a civil war. Yeah. Right. That there yeah. are people who, you know, I don't know to you, does it feel like the U.S. Civil War, brother against brother? Like, in what way does it feel like a civil war to you that then opened up this problem of loyalists? It, it does. I mean, it's, it's very and it's also very, very hard feelings. Right. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of things that we should we should think in terms of temper tantrums or um, or because uh, or, it's really hard feelings of betrayal. Uh, that the king has has done these. I mean, the, the king has has done these terrible things to us. Um, I mean, Jefferson's uh, um, the the rough the rough draft uh, of the Declaration, and and anybody who hasn't read the rough draft, you should read the rough draft about uh, especially the the bit that gets cut out. Uh, and and I, we could talk about that too about if you just just looking at the editing process of of the Declaration on the second and third of July. Where does the Congress spend their time? really getting this right, uh, the bulk of the beginning of the declaration, the first two paragraphs, the preamble that everybody knows, the first 20 or so grievances are just very lightly edited. Where the bulk of all of the, uh, all of the, yeah, you, you see this on the, on the thing, but all that text that you see there uh, is with, with a few minor, you know, um, instead of inalienable, it's, uh, it's it's unalienable. Like they just make the changes. But when we get down to the bottom, if you take the next slide, um, uh, can I have the next slide? 
Ah, there we go. The bottom where I've circled it in blue is the last one, that deal breaker that says uh, he has excited domestic insurrectionists and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the, the merciless Indian savages. That's not how that actually first was written. Jefferson had a long paragraph about uh, a, a, a impassioned, <laughs> beautiful paragraph about how awful and terrible the, the, the African slave trade is. In capital, in capital letters, underlying things, he's shouting at us, as we know from texting parlance in these capital letters, uh, things like calling it an assemblage of horrors, calling it piratical warfare, calling it all these terrible things. And at the end of that paragraph, he says, and then it's this horrible thing. And then the king is now inciting domestic insurrectionists against us, using these same people to murder us that they shouldn't have been here in the first place. And the Congress takes all the beginning part out and keeps that that other part. They take out they, they take out the anti-slavery part and they keep the Dunmore's proclamation part and then attaches it to this last one. That's what's in there. And I think about if we think about abolitionists in the 1850s, like Wendell Phillips or or or, or Frederick Douglass, what they would have done with that language. They do remarkable things with the Declaration. They really radicalized in some way the Declaration. But if that would have been in there still, oh man, that would have been just so tremendous to keep. But it, but but I think it go, but it goes away, right? Because it's that's threatening the Union, right? Uh, Anti-slavery, ooh, that's a little controversial. Dunmore, no, that's not controversial. Um, so I think we've time maybe for two more questions. Okay. Um, so I'll limit myself. So the first one, since you so kindly highlighted it here, um, just, you know, opens up, um, for me that, that final phrase, right. Um, where the, um, they're talking about destruction of people of all ages, sexes, and conditions. And the story that you've been telling us so far is a story of Adams and Jefferson and Washington, sort of our big guy founders, um, right. do important, um, it, it, indeed essential things for your story, quite rightly. Um, but I'm wondering, is there a place for um, these other people, children, women, right? Um, right. Actually right. People who are enslaved, as we talk about conditions, I think that right. means conditions of servitude. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, what I, this is a book that's, um, to me, the, these stories about race really sort of s jumped out at me as I was reading these things. And it's, it, they're being, uh, the Patriot leaders are being very explicit about them. Um, they're being less explicit and more implicit, I think, about, about things like uh, protecting families, about, about masculinity and femininity, those things are what we would consider today questions about gender. Those things are very there, but they're almost sort of assumed like this. You're going to uh, you're going to take action to defeat uh, enslaved people to protect your families from these things. And they don't they don't make that point as explicitly or as propagandally, although sometimes they do. There's a lot of stories about about uh, one of the things that's also in, in, in 13 clocks is about. Uh, the Hessians, the, the German mercenaries that come, uh, and about how um, immediately they're also seen as another, which is also in the declaration here about, about foreign mercenaries, they're seen as this other threat, but immediately they go away and they're not seen as that anymore. One of the reasons they're seen as a threat is because they are raping women in, in New Jersey. Uh, and that is something that, that the Patriot leaders talk a lot about as Washington is getting all this stuff for Trenton. He's really trying to get that message out there. You've got to defend families from these things. And and another story that's also in in um, Common Cause is also about and in Thirteen Clocks is about Jane McRae, uh, about uh, the uh, there are there are three things, three things that I found that were in every single newspaper in America. Three stories: Lexington and Concord, Declaration of Independence, Jane McRae. Jane McRae is a loyalist woman who is allegedly killed by natives who are allied to John Burgoyne in the Saratoga campaign in 1777. And she's, in she's in New York and she's, and she's uh, killed and she may or may not have been in her wedding dress when she was killed. And the fact that they kill a woman who was a, uh, uh, engaged to a loyalist and maybe one herself just shows you the depravity 
of the British and their natives for doing these terrible things. Using her story is so important because it, 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 it's both gender and race tied together. Um, so, uh, so there's a, there's a lot of that. I, I, I haven't focused out that, that part of it in the story, but because there's a lot of it's implicit, but, uh, but I think it's very much there. So, um, and I think in our, in our final five minutes, um, maybe you could talk a moment about um, the resonances of your book for the contemporary moment. What do you imagine that people as they read it right now, today, I hope this afternoon, um, you know, it, in what ways does it echo? In what ways is this a book, as, as all books are, a product of its moment and, and what moment, perhaps? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, historians very much are shaped by the questions of the, the questions they asked uh, as human beings are questions of, of the moment um, uh, well, or how they perceive of them from their from their kind of uh, their frame of reference. And um, what really got me involved, I mean, I knew I wanted to write something about think, the questions about race and the revolution. That was where I began this. But I had no idea where how to focus this. Right. I had no idea what I was going to do until I started reading those newspapers until I really began, they began to kind of shout out at me. And the, and the idea of seeing them in the same thing over and over again, seeing Jane McRae over and over and just sort of bombarding me with the same language, I began to think about what that might, might do. But I was doing this over the last 20 years where, and, and when I would talk about this, this book, people would say, oh, that's, that's about Barack Obama. Oh, that's about um, uh, War on Terror. Oh, that's about, um, uh, remember John Ashcroft and his, his different color-coded uh, uh, terror alert things and about because it's a it's a story about race and fear and oh it's about tea party oh uh donald trump um birth certificates like and i and it's funny how it keeps coming up and all these things right I, now to my mind i was really focused on those microfilm newspapers but look at all that talk and it still continues right we are still it's so many moments, it also sort of reinforces just how important race and fear and politics and and um, constitution, especially constitutional change is. Those things all very much go together. It's part of one long sort of conversation, but it's also very contingent. It's choices people are making to talk about these things that I think uh, is something we should be keeping in mind about what is it... We continue to reach into that toolbox and pick up those things. Um, to, to, and and that, that's something that, uh, in American history is something we should really begin to think about. So in those ways, your book um, turns out to be sort of a, um, a, a telescope for us to be able to see um, things that are both far away, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. yet part of part of the, you know, larger universe in which, in which we live. That's a good um, way to put it. Thank you so much, Rob. It was such a pleasure to be part of the National Archives program on um, the founding history of the United States, to have a chance to talk with you about this, um, this wonderful book, which is a pleasure to read and thank to think and to talk about. Um, so thank you so much. Oh, thank you.